listening to SOJC Radio, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. Good evening and welcome to Friday night SOJC Remnant Gathering. Grab your Bible and your pens and your paper and when two or three are gathered in his name, the Lord is right here with us. So thank you for joining us and here's Brother David. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the May 12th, 2023 edition of the FOJC Remnant Gathering. I am David Carey Cohen. For the next hour, we will be studying the Word of God. That's what we do here, and we're so thankful for all of you that are joining us for that. It is hopping a poppin' here at Puritan Barn and FOJC. So much going on. Um... I might draw your attention to a new edition of the Holy Commission Boot Camp that has gone up. It's a new series that, what Donna? It's a new series that is now up on, uh, we have an episode up on YouTube, went up this week. It's also up on Rumble and also there's another teaching by Brett Graham uploaded this week to Rumble on breaking those institutional chains and we need to be able to help our friends to break out of this bondage that they're in also there was a new episode of enduring sound doctrine that aired last night and uh, that is up i was very pleased with the way that came out that is there on the he walks with us everywhere youtube channel And this Sunday night on Sunday Night Live, Tracy and I will be giving a presentation at 8 p.m. Sunday night on the Priests of the Feathered Serpent. Uh, We're continuing to study the dispersion at Babel and how this uh, priesthood of Nimrod spread. So join us for that. Also, Pentecost is coming May 28th. Get registered. Go to our ministry news page and you can get a link there to be registered to come out to the Puritan Barn for the Feast of Pentecost celebration. And I guarantee you, it is going to be a celebration. So we would be so thankful for any of you that can come out for that, that we will be able to meet you personally. We're going to pray, as always. Um always so many things to pray about the spiritual warfare is intensifying I guarantee you it is and for all of those that are standing up and raising up the standard the enemy is certainly going to come in like a flood upon you but that's all right because we have the Lord most high to hold up our banner so let's go to the Lord in prayer and oh, also I want to make mention here a request from Winona and uh, her five children and grandchildren for salvation and wisdom. Uh, I, re- uh, I do believe in, I read her request and she was talking about being distracted on the Sabbath. Well, yeah, uh-huh, that's what the devil does. I don't like anybody messing with my Sabbath, you know. That's, that's for me and the Lord, so... Um, you know hands off that devil uh also uh a shout out to star uh we received the package very thankful and uh we're just um just a thankful bunch of people around here uh just thankful and happy with all the lord's done so let's go to the lord in prayer father we want to thank you once again for a chance to come before you and lift up our requests unto you father we pray and lift up the Israel of God that you'll just give your people wisdom and revelation to walk in your ways and stand in your truth father we want to pray this evening for Winona and all of her children and grandchildren that you would just give them clarity and just give them salvation conviction of the Holy Spirit where it is needed and father we want to pray for all of the israel of god that we just come into a place of clarity and focus where we can focus our minds on the things of god and 
we just come against this satanic interference of trying to keep us from being able to focus. And Father, we just want to continue to bind the sweet influences that are coming against us in whatever area you are. All of those sweet influences from the second heaven that are blinding people's minds to the uh, to the real truth of the gospel and what's really important. And we want to pray also for Jared's brother, Evan. And uh, he's having an adverse reaction. So we just want to pray for him in Jesus' name that uh, the Holy Spirit will just touch him now. Father, we just pray that you just let your anointing be upon him now in Jesus name we want to pray for Winona we want to uh, you just lift that request up to her and father we want to pray for the ministry here and everyone involved in it that father you'll just help us to continue to be able to just seek your face father and to just continue to labor for salvation of the lost so father we just thank you once again we just pray that you just anoint this broadcast and use it to bring people into the kingdom and to uplift the Israel of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we agree. Amen and amen. Worship the Lord for just a few moments and we will be back with our message for this evening, When Saints Feast and Lions Starve. We're sorry, but because of copyright rules, you cannot hear my music. However, if you want to hear the message in its entirety with my music, you can join us on the radio page on Friday night for the live audio broadcast at 6 p.m. Central Time, or you can listen on our podcast page at fojcradio.com. Here's Brother David. Turn in your Bibles to the 34th Psalm. And we're going to begin reading in the seventh verse. When saints feast and lions starve. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. Yeah, I could just stop there and rejoice for a little bit. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. The scripture certainly speaks of the time when lions starve and saints feast and this is some of the most precious promises that we see in scripture and always what we need to understand that with every promise of God there is a condition and when we meet the condition we can pray the promise and in the 10th verse when it talks about those of the Israel of God not wanting any good thing the condition is clear the young lions do lack and suffer hunger but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing it is on the condition that this people seeks the Lord that this is a promise that we can claim and this is something we're going to be looking at this evening this promise and other promises in the Word of God. And we're really going to have to fight this fight on our knees. We're going to really have to pray. And, of course, that's always true, isn't it? But I can really feel the spiritual war increasing. I can feel those waves of darkness that want to come in and assault my mind and my spirit. And I have to be aware, as all of us do, that these things can be dealt with in the Spirit of God. I've been thinking a lot here lately and uh, talking a lot about spiritual warfare and prayer because the battle is really heating up, and we only win this by seeking the face of the Lord. And 
pouring out our heart to him and praying the promises of God. In Second Peter 1 and 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. These are precious promises, and we are going to study these conditions so that we can make sure that we stand in a position where we can pray and claim and believe this tremendous promise to where we can have provision even when the strong are are starving and falling by the wayside. Charles Spurgeon preached a sermon on this text in 1856 and Brother Spurgeon said this, Now let me show you that the Christian, in whatever portion of his spiritual history he may be, he is one that seeks the Lord. And boy, this is so profoundly true. If we would put a definition on what a Christian is or what a believer uh, in the, the Israel of God is, it would be one that seeks the Lord. The Israel of God will seek God. Any true believer will seek God. Those that are not, or the Gentiles, if you will, they will not seek God. Brother Spurgeon goes on. He says, that is where God begins with us. And no man is a Christian unless the Holy Spirit has revealed to him his own entire helplessness, his want of merit, and absence of power, ever to accumulate merit in the sight of God. Well then, the man who is under a conviction of sin and feels his need of a Savior, what is he doing? What is his occupation? Now that he is hungering and thirsting after righteousness, why, he is seeking the Lord. And this is where it begins with us. As Brother Spurgeon rightly said, when the Holy Spirit awakens within us that we are a sinner, this is when we begin to move toward the Lord and seek Him, and we begin to find that precious gospel that we were born sinful and that Jesus Christ died upon the cross for our sins, and when we put our faith in his death upon the cross for our sin debt, we repent and believe the gospel, the miraculous new birth takes place. The fundamental truth that we are a sinner is greatly blurred in the modern institutional church. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And that means you. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This text speaking specifically to that sinful nature that will remain with us until we put off this mortal coil. Now, while that sinful nature does stay within us. I like the old saying that the old preachers used to use, that sin does remain, but it does not reign. And we have and we stand in the righteousness of Christ. And one of the big problems and one of the tremendous disadvantages that people have that sit in these institutional churches week in, week, week out, in 1 John 3 and 4, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law, the absolute nullification of the law from the pulpits in the in, in America, and I know this is true, in whatever nation you're listening to this FOJC broadcast that sends the transgression of the law, and because the law is not preached, people don't know what sin is. It's even popular in the Word of Faith movement to say that you don't talk about sin or the people will have a sin consciousness. Oh, that I would. We all had a sin consciousness because without that sin consciousness, we will never seek the Lord and we will never come into a place where we're going to be able to claim this marvelous and this precious promise. Let's turn to the great prophet Isaiah 
And let's read the words of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 55, and we're going to read verses 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Now there's a, something implied in that text, isn't it? We are to seek the Lord while he may be found. That means there's going to be times when he won't be able to be found. And this is true in individuals' lives. Every time the Spirit of God moves upon you to repent of sin or draw closer to him or to move on on your service for God, every time you grieve the Holy Spirit in disobedience, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And people can be so seared in their conscience and so taken over by foul spirits that it is no longer possible for them to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. When a person comes to the place where your heaven is iron, your prayers no longer go through, it's time for repentance. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Seeking the Lord is forsaking sin. There is no seeking God without a forsaking of sin. And let the unrighteous man his thoughts. This goes deep. Seeking the Lord goes deep. It goes not only to our actions. It goes not only to the inherent cleansing of our fallen nature. But it goes even into our thought life. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon this is the message this evening that the Lord will have mercy upon you we have all strayed we have all failed to attain and press toward the mark as we should but there's mercy the mercy seat is open for all of those that need to wipe the slate clean to forsake their sin forsake their unrighteous thoughts and to return back unto the Lord this evening. And there's a marvelous scripture in Psalm 24 and you know I brag on the scriptures all the time. You couldn't find one that isn't marvelous. But in the 24th Psalm and the 6th verse there's a statement that's also a prophecy. This is the generation of them that Seek thy face, O Jacob, the Salah. And this, there's a couple layers of meaning to that. Indeed, probably even more than that. I'll read the comment from the Treasury of David. And the Treasury of David is a marvelous work. Uh, it would be a great addition to anyone's library. Uh, it was put together by Charles Spurgeon, where he give his commentary on the Book of Psalms. And he just quotes dozens and dozens of Puritans and old writers. It's just a real basket of jewels in that marvelous book of Psalms that is so fantastic. But the comment on this sixth verse in the treasury of David, this is the generation by the demonstrative pronoun this, the psalmist erases from the catalog of the servants of God all counterfeit Israelites who, trusting only to their circumcision and the sacrifice of beasts, have no concern about offering themselves to God. And yet, at the same time, they rashly thrust themselves into the church. As Brother Spurgeon began in that other comment, he defined what a believer is, a believer is someone that seeks God. And someone that does not seek God, what they are, they are an unbeliever. This is indeed. And how many today, the thousands and even millions of people that go in and out of the church house on Sunday morning, they go in and many of them do believe that they're believers, but they are lost because they are not seeking God. Seeking God is not even something that comes into their mind because if they ever were born again, they have come to the place where their hearts are so cold that it would freeze you to death to touch them. So that is our prayer. Our prayer and much of our outreach is unto our friends that 
are are deceived by this religious veneer that they believe that gives them salvation. But so rightly said, this text is a dividing line. The one in Psalms and the one uh, that we began with, if you are not seeking God and seeking God, that means forsaking sin and even down to the deepest part of your thoughts. That's what seeking God is. It's something that is a lifelong uh, endeavor. One of Charles, or uh, excuse me, one of John Wesley's 52 sermons is on repentance in believers. And, you know, it is just so true. We need to understand, contrary to the popular ideas that are put out, repentance, and a lot of times people don't even put repentance in the original gospel invitation. But we not only repent and believe the gospel, but every day of our life, repentance is a part of it repentance and seeking god forsaking sin down to the thought level and pressing toward that mark of the high calling of god in jesus christ in matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 a blessed text from the doctrine of christ but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And there's our word seek again. And it's talking here in the text in Matthew 6 about those things that we all need. We all need food and shelter. There are all needs. And also uh, the, the text in Psalm says you shall not want any good thing. It's also all right to want things if they're right and proper. And it's also to pray and ask God for them. But we're going to get a little clarification on how that shakes out. But here again in Matthew chapter 6, we see conditions, don't we? The conditions are, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And I want to read a comment from William Perkins. William Perkins wrote in the 1500s, He is one of my favorite writers that doesn't use the KJV because he died before the King James Bible was even translated. He used the Geneva Bible, which is a correct translation from the proper text, and he founded Puritanism before the King James Bible was even translated. But this is Brother Perkins' comment. He said, first seek, that is before all, And above all, worldly things, let your principal care and endeavor be to procure these unto yourselves. Now, right there, I mean, let's just be real. We have this text and this comment that eliminates, oh, I mean, just the vast majority of professed Christians today. Professed Christians today, they think that maybe seeking God is something we might do if we have a tragedy or if we'd get a terminal illness or whatever. But seeking God is the fundamental definition of what a believer is. And it has to be first, before, above all, worldly things. And if this isn't the case, you are not seeking God. By kingdom of God, Brother Perkins goes on, is here meant a mental state and condition of man in this life, whereby in Christ he enjoys the favor of God and has right to everlasting life. I like to use the the term, the slate has to be clean. The sins have to be under the blood. I know each day I have to be in a place where the Holy Spirit is connected to my spirit, to where I can pray and I can read the Word of God and the Spirit of God can speak to me. I cannot have a day when that is not the case, when the Word of God doesn't jump off the page fresh, when the Spirit of God doesn't make the soul leap with excitement. We have to put first the kingdom. And in the text, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, uh, so many times the false doctrine of our age it will want to separate things that the word of God does not separate in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 
and the 30th verse, the text says of Jesus, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, of whom is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And the way things are going nowadays, well, I want Jesus for redemption, but uh, I don't know about that sanctification stuff. You know, I'll take Jesus for salvation, but now that sanctification of that holiness stuff, now, I don't know, maybe someday, maybe not, but the Bible tells us that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Brother Perkins had this to say. He says, but how should we get this righteousness, seeing it is in Christ? Answer, it is made ours by imputation. The Bible clearly tells us there's none righteous, no, not one. All of our righteousness is as a filthy rag, but Christ becomes our righteousness, and we stand in the righteousness of Christ, but we don't want to miss this. This is what Brother Perkin tells us. Now, with this imputed righteousness, we must understand and join the fruit hereof in us, which is sanctification or renewed holiness, whereby we are enabled to walk before God in new obedience, bringing forth the fruits of righteousness. For these two are never severed. Amen. For these two are never severed, whom God justifies by the righteousness of Christ, then he sanctifies by his Spirit. There is certainly growth in grace. There is certainly deliverance and the breaking of strongholds. But as there is no such thing as someone that is a child of God that lives, that lives in habitual sin. This is no such thing exists. People try to preach that creature into existence, but I tell you, Bigfoot's more real than that. There is no such creature as that. Now, in the book of Philippians, in the third chapter, it speaks of the righteousness of Christ, and we are admonished to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8, Paul said, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. It speaks of in the text here in Philippians 3 about Paul how he excelled as a Pharisee. He was studied on some of the most brilliant teachers of that which would become Talmud and Kabbalah. And what he said of all of that learning and all of that religious experience, he summed it up very well in that one word. He counted it all as dung. That is how we should look upon any religious instruction that is not the doctrine of Christ and the pure word of God. It is is dung. In verse 9, and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. There is a relationship there between the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. We cannot know the power of the resurrection without the fellowship of his suffering. And if we will just meet the condition, if we will just seek after the Lord, we can come before the Lord and we can pray and we can pray the promises of God, and we can pray the word of God in time of fat cataclysm, in time of famine, and in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that God worketh in us. You want to know what the Lord can do with you? Much more 
than you even think. We've got a big God, and we need to pray God, to, to pray big to our big God. We've got a great big God, and we've got a little bitty devil. Let's pray the word of God, and let's stand fast in trusting him. In the book of Matthew chapter 6, in the sixth chapter of Matthew, beginning in verse 31, and here again we see a clear definition. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? That does not refer to laziness. It refers to undue worry and anxiety. I always have been a strong advocate of preparation. I always uh, believe that whatever the issue is, when the Lord takes hold and does for us, it is after we've done what we can do. The Lord does not condone laziness. And this text here, it's speaking against, uh, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the worry of the world. We can listen to the news and all the crazy stuff going on, and it can make you feel like you want to lose your mind. But we're not marching to the drum of that beast world system. We're marching to the drum of the kingdom. And the captain of our salvation our Lord Jesus Christ is leading the way. Now, look at the second verse. For all these things do the Gentile seek. This is a line of demarcation between the Israel of God and the Gentiles. What's a Gentile? A Gentile is anyone that's not a true Jew. The only Jew there is now is that which is by faith of Jesus Christ. We are the Israel of God, and the Israel of God seeks his face and trusts him. Now the Gentiles, now the Gentiles, they listen to the evening news. They hear about the dollar crashing. They hear about all that, and they get all twisted up and bent out of shape about it. Those are the Gentiles. They're seeking after the things of the earth. They worry about the things of the earth. And again, I want to emphasize, the Lord does not condone laziness. The Lord does not condone a lack of sensible preparation. But we do not need to worry. We do not to need to worry about our physical provision if we meet the conditions <coughs> We have the promise and the assurance of God that he will provide for us. Even when the lions are starving, the Israel of God will be fed. Just like when he fed Elijah, he sent ravens to feed Elijah by the brook Cherith. And the Lord spoke unto Elijah, and he said this was in a tremendous time of persecution by Ahab and Jezebel, and he spoke to him specifically, you go down to the brook Cherith. He obeyed, and the Lord sent birds to bring him food. That's the God we serve this evening. And yes, by all means, do what we can to sensibly prepare, but... Absolutely, the most important thing by far and away by 10,000% is seeking the face of God, meeting those conditions, and praying the promises of God, whereby we know that when the lions starve, that we will feast upon the good things of God, and that our needs will be met in Jesus' name. In Revelation, the third chapter, this is one of the favorite texts of the rapture people. And it's one of the many texts they use to lull people to sleep in disobedience. <coughs> but in Revelation 3 and 10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Now you see there, I was talking about this text last week about uh, the perfect work of patience. But there's a, there's a condition and a promise here, isn't there? Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And I want to draw your attention to that phrase, that 
dwell upon the earth. That is more than a geographical location. That is also a spiritual identifier. Now, this text is wrongly used by the rapture people to tell people that they're not going to go through the end time tribulation because they're going to be raptured out of the world. That understanding only came into being, uh, and I should say that misunderstanding only came into being during the after the 1800s. But I want to read the comment of Albert Barnes. He really nails this text here in Revelation 3 and 10. He says, That is, I will so keep you that you shall not sink under the trials which prove a severe temptation to many. Amen. There's going to be people that are going to be going down on the left hand and on the right. But this is our precious promise that we will not sink. Amen. This does not mean that they would be actually kept from calamity of all kinds, but that they would be kept from the temptation of apostasy and calamity. He would give them grace to bear up under trials with a Christian spirit and in such a manner that their salvation should not be endangered. Amen. Now, I want to bookend this text with a, a text from the Doctrine of Christ in John chapter 17 and 15. And Revelation 3 and 10, that's the Doctrine of Christ also because Jesus was speaking there too, wasn't he? And in John chapter 17 and verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. So, you know, if Jesus said that he doesn't pray for people to be taken out of the world, you know, they pe- they need to stop their silly cliches over here and in the air. And they'll have their goofy rapture drills. Well, they're, th- th- I mean, they literally jump up and down and they call it a rapture drill. I mean, it's a clown show. Jesus said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that Thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And I guarantee you... Verse 22, please. You want to read what, Donna? Verse 20. Sister Donna wants me to read verse 20. It says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Jesus is praying for you. Isn't that something? Jesus is praying for you this evening. (coughs) That's an awesome thought. Now, let's take this phrase, them that dwell on the earth, and let's follow that through the book of Revelation just a little bit here. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11. And those, the, the book of Revelation talks about those that dwell on the earth and those that dwell in heaven. And basically, this was defined by Jesus in Matthew 6, the Gentiles or the pagans, or those that don't know Christ, they dwell on the earth. In other words, they're only concerned with earthly things. The the Israel of God, they are concerned with heavenly things. They seek first the kingdom of God. In Revelation chapter 11, let's begin in verse 8. And the way that the world and the Israel of God looks at, at events, they're totally different. In Revelation chapter 8, It speaks of the time of the revelation of the two witnesses. It says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth... There's that phrase. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth. We could take the entire uh, agenda of transgenderism and every time there's a law or anything in favor of that, I mean, they rejoice. They're all about it but not the Israel of God. And when something comes up for righteousness, whenever it does happen or to oppose them, boy, there is the anger 
and there is the rage. And there will be the rejoicing when these two witnesses that tormented them with the need to repent and come back into obedience to God. Now, in Revelation chapter 13, we see here in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation a clear delineation between those that dwell on the earth and those that dwell in heaven. And this is just a defining of who's in the Israel of God and who isn't. Revelation chapter 13 will begin in verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Do we have any heaven dwellers? in the house this evening. Do you dwell in heaven? Well, we're going to spell out just what that means. In verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, what that text means, and this is also a book in Scripture with Daniel, the 7th chapter and the 21st verse, it's going to be just like when the Nazis conquered France in World War II. And the Nazis come in and they took over everything. But life went on, but there was just a new ruler over your finances, over your medical system, over everything. But there was the resistance. There was the famous courageous stories of the French resistance that raised up in rebellion against that Nazi regime. Well, I tell you right now, and I was talking with Brett here just last night, and, uh, you know, uh, and about the concept and the breaking chains teaching that just went up on um, our Rumble channel. It, you know, like, to quote Pedro Martinez, who's your daddy? And if the Father in heaven is not your daddy, this demonic beast system's your daddy. It's one way or another. Who are you trusting? Who are you serving? What will it take for you to bow the knee to that demonic beast system? Now's the time to ask those questions and to get the answer firm in your mind because this beast is taken over. And he pretty much has taken over now. And we are going to be overcome in the sense that, yes, the the finance, everything is going to be controlled. But let me tell you, the resistance will go on because we are the resistance and we will never bow the knee unto Baal. In verse 8, it says, and all, and here's that phrase again, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. The Gentiles, those that are not in the Israel of God, they will worship the beast because their concern is toward the things of this world. The only ones that will not worship the beast are those that dwell in heaven, those that have the perspective of seeking first the kingdom of God. If you are not seeking God, you will worship the beast because it says in the 8th verse of the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and then there is this in Revelation chapter 7 of uh, there's, there was a teaching we did uh, just a couple of weeks ago on the 144,000 on the Enduring Sound Doctrine broadcast on He Walks With Us Everywhere YouTube channel. And Revelation 7 says this, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another great angel descending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. I remember R.H. Charles comment on this. He says that this was protection from the demonic attack of this demonic legion that will be released from the pit 
in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation. But let me show how that the sealing of the servants of God and the 144,000, this is the end time remnant of the Israel of God, praise God. And of course, everything that's taught from sunup to sundown is going to put a racial interpretation upon this to try to exclude anyone that isn't a physical Jew from God's end time remnant. And I love to ask them, what percentage of Jewish blood are you going to have to have to get in? You're going to get in at 75, 50, 3%. Maybe if your neighbor's Jewish, you get in. Maybe if your dog's Jewish, you get in. They need to stop lying. And it's not just a matter of lying, or I know better than these guys. It's a matter of people being deceived and cheated out of the role that the Lord has for them to play. It's too important to play nice with these false teachers. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to see the Lord on Mount Zion with the 144,000. There was a great comment I read. I like this from the preacher's homiletical commentary. This was a, about a 38-volume work put together in the 1800s. But it says this, that we may be assured of the safety of of God's faithful ones, amen, even during the time of the triumph of the beast and the false prophet, we are shown the sealed ones all secure and in charge of the Lamb. Let's read it. Let's read it. And in Revelation chapter 14, and I looked, and lo, a Lamb stood on the Mount Sion, with, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in the foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. And these are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb. Now notice here that's present tense. This isn't just talking about people that have died, but this is talking about people that were following the Lamb right then. They follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto the God unto God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne. And I saw another angel in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth. The heaven dwellers are before the throne. And you see, this isn't just a pie in the sky by and by. This is right now, my friends. This is right now. The sealing of God is right now. We are sealed when we set the testimony of Christ to ourself. And in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, for by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us set together in Heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's just what we saw in Revelation chapter 14. We saw not only all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, of the real Israel of God, that have died in the faith and went on, but also those that are seated in Christ in heavenly places, those that have sought the face of God and are under the protection of the sealing of the Lamb upon Mount Sion. Now let's look at Hebrews 12 in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. This gives us a picture of just what we saw in Revelation chapter 7. We saw the Israel of God right now. And of course John saw this vision. He saw this vision in about the year 100 A.D., and that is still a scene that's going on right now. And in Hebrews chapter 12, let's read a little text here. 
beginning in verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it should it shall be stoned or thrust through with the dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come. But ye are come. That means we are come right now. And where are we come to? But ye are come unto the Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God. That's what John saw in Revelation 14. He saw the Lamb on Mount Sion with the 144,000 sealed before the throne. That's you, sister. That's you. Whatever race you are, whatever color you are, whatever sex you are, being male or female, we are seated with him now. We are sealed and with the Lamb upon Mount Zion now. We are come. Listen to the book of Hebrews. Verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. That's what happened in Revelation 14. That's a glimpse into the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, the sealed 144,000 standing before God with all of the saints of God that have ever died in the faith, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all men, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Praise God. Praise God. The, this is a precious truth that we need not just comprehend on the intellectual level. But we need to come boldly before the throne until we come into the assembly of the firstborn, the church of the living God, with Jesus Christ upon Mount Zion. It's now. It's now, and it's real. Jesus is waiting there for you at the right hand of God, and he is praying for you and I at this very moment. Well, with that, I'm going to take a break. And I'm going to get a little drink of coffee, and we're going to get ready for just a bit more. So we're going to take a break, and we're going to be right back in just a moment on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. This is Tracy Vanay from He Walks With Us Everywhere over on YouTube. Knowing the doctrine of Christ is the most important thing in your life, whether you know it or not, as David Carrico says. We are excited to bring you the sound doctrine we need to endure these last days. Our newest original series, Enduring Sound Doctrine, is now airing on my YouTube channel. In Matthew 24, 13, Jesus says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I like to say it's not a hop, skip, and jump to the end. It's an enduring. We welcome you to come over to He Walks With Us, one word, everywhere, and subscribe, like, and share. And please remember to subscribe, like, and share FOJC Radio's YouTube channel, Underground, one word, church. Thank you for listening to the content that we're presenting, and of course, for your support and your love and your prayers. We hope to see you over there. Hello, FOJC Radio Remnant family. Sister Donna here. I just want to thank all of you for your support and your love and kindness. Just wanted to let you know that here at FOJC Radio, we want to reach the world for Jesus. I know you know this verse. You've said it as a child probably many times. But as a reminder, in John 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, For God so loved the world, 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In order to do this, we have chosen to use many different avenues. We have our regular Friday night message with Brother David, and then we have our Sunday night live, and we have different people on it. And then we have other Sunday Night Live programs with David and Tracy. Sometimes we're on Rumble and sometimes we're on YouTube. You just never know who we might have on there. But I just wanted to remind you all and thank you for your support and give us a listen on Sunday Night Live. These programs usually start at 8 p.m. Central Time. You never know what we might be doing. We're full of all kinds of surprises. We want to reach the world for Jesus. This is entitled Wolves, written on November the 5th, 2022, Sabbath morning, 6.47 a.m. Wolves in sheepskin, they are plenty. Standing at your pulpit, spewing lies, half-truths, and apostasy. Smooth things they cry, itching ears they find. No conviction of souls, no bended knee. Just put your money in the plate before thee. Eyes to see, ears to hear is what you need. The word spoken, the light of the world for you and me. Faith, obedience, and humility. Come to the Father and be truly free. Don't wait a second longer. Hear him now. Time is short, you see. Come out of her, my people. Now back to tonight's message with Brother David Carrico on FOJC Radio. Welcome back to the FOJC Remnant Gathering, and as I always do at the break, I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you that prays for us and that studies with us and that supports us with your gifts and with your kindness. We really appreciate it from the bottom of our heart. We could not do it without your support. Quick reminder for those of you that joined late, May the 28th at Puritan Barn, Feast of Pentecost celebration, get, get, Get registered and get here. Go to our ministry news page on our uh, FOJC radio homepage, and it will link you with the registration. Also, Sunday night, 8 p.m. Central, Sunday night live, Tracy and I will be bringing to you the feasts, the priests of the feathered serpent. All right, we're going to get back into our study for this evening. When lions starve and feasts and saints feast, we're going to look at the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, the 29th verse, 29th chapter and the 13th verse. The word of God gives us the condition of seeking God. And if we seek the Lord, we can stand by faith and pray the promises of God in Psalm 84 and 10 that we will not want any good thing in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13 and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart the first and great commandment of the Lord that we are to the love the Lord our God with all of our heart soul mind and strength and if if we will just put Jesus first, if we'll just fall in love with Jesus and seek him, uh, it's game over. You can pray the promises of God, and you will never want any good thing. In the book of Proverbs, in the second chapter, we will look at the first five verses. Proverbs chapter 2, my son... 
if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding yea if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God you want to find God seek him with all of your heart do you really want to understand the knowledge of God you can if you will pursue it it doesn't have anything to do with your IQ or your intellectual capacity I can thank God for that but it has to do with how much you want it do you want the truth and the knowledge of God as much as you want the earthly pursuits as you're pursuing here again we see this line of demarcation don't we there are those that dwell upon the earth they are obsessed and focused upon the things of this world but then there are those that will pursue after the wisdom and the knowledge of God as much as they do earthly things and we have the promise from the word of God that they will indeed find it and it reminds me of that uh, the new teaching Brett put up on Rumble about the chains of this institutionalized bondage that's on us in so many ways. And people, so many people, they're in bondage. They don't even know they are. Uh, they're thankful for their chains. They love them. And in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. You will either love the truth and you will seek after it or you will serve the beast. If you're seeking God, you will be pursuing the truth of God. Let me tell you, when a person really begins to seek the Lord, I've had so many people testify that, wow it's like the blinders came off and then it just come at them like a flood they could just see that obese system everywhere but so many people they don't love the truth they won't seek things out they won't question they won't investigate whether it's biblical doctrine or things that are going on in our world that the word of god tells us about it they don't love the truth and they're not even concerned enough to seek it out those people are going to perish in Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 22, it reminds me of the text when it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 22, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? Now, isn't that a great question for our nation this evening? How long, simple ones, will ye love simplicity? How long are you going to love the brain dead fog that you're in and the horrific bondage and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge turn you at my reproof I will pour out my spirit upon you I will make known my words unto you all we have to do is repent line up with the word of God he will make known his words unto you because I have called and ye refused I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded but ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof I also will laugh at your calamity I will mock when your fear cometh when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction is a whirlwind when distress and anguish cometh upon you then they shall call upon me but I will not answer remember the prophet Isaiah he said seek the Lord while he may be found many people are setting themselves up for a big big fall and they've already fallen the the roof just hasn't fallen in on them yet then they shall call upon me but I will not answer and they shall seek me early but they shall not find me seek the Lord while he may be found he may be found tonight he may be found tonight and it's time to seek him now for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord like Paul said in Thessalonians they received not the love of the truth 
that they might be saved. They would none of my counsel. They despised all of my reproof. They despise it to the place where they actually say it no longer even has any validity or application. Therefore, they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. The Israel of God will be filled with the good things of God and those that hate knowledge, they hate instruction, they will be filled with the fruit of their own ways. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. My Lord, Hear this this evening in Jesus' name. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. As it said, how long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? We pray the Spirit of God will stir those that are in the depth of this satanic deception and give them a moment of clarity in Jesus' name to repent and turn from their evil ways. For the turning away of the simple will slay them. If you want to go to hell and you're listening to this message this evening and you don't know Jesus Christ, you just turn away and you will seal your fate forevermore in a devil's hell. Seek the Lord while he may be found. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. How many people are rich and increased with goods? And how many churches have more money than ever before? There are more churches with more money and more people in them than ever before, with more hours of religious broadcasting on television and radio, and the more those numbers increase, the deeper this nation goes down into the demonic cesspool. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer to figure out what's going on there. How long will ye love simplicity, O simple ones? The Oh my goodness, the dumbed down, prayerless, scriptureless lessons that are coming out from these apostate pulpits. Oh God, stir people's hearts this evening. In verse 33 of Proverbs 1, But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. In the 14th chapter, of the book of Proverbs in the 14th verse. This was one of Charles Finney's uh, sections in his teaching on revival lectures. In Proverbs 14 and 14, he said, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Well, there's both sides of the coin. How many people go into church on Sunday morning, they look good, they smell good, they go in there and they sing, oh, how I love Jesus, their head and their body's in the pew, but their heart is somewhere else because they are not seeking God, their backslidden heart, they will be filled with their own ways, but the person that seeks God will be filled from that faith in Christ within himself that will pray the promises of God when the lion's are starving, we will not want any good thing. In the book of Matthew, chapter 7, let's look at some more conditions here. In the seventh chapter of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, and let's begin in verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now we've got three more conditions, don't we? Ask, seek, and knock. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Oh, yeah. Now, I want to read uh, William Perkins' comment on this text. And Brother Perkins said this, Ask, seek, and knock, each whereof has its promise annexed thereto. Ye shall have. It is the conditions that when they are met that we shall have. And I tell you what, 
we need to really dig down and get a hold of this one because I tell you what, the Lord is really answering prayer. And uh, now is really the time to seek the Lord and to pour out our hearts in him to prayer. Now, it's not every kind of asking that's being talked about here. Not every kind of asking in prayer gets answered in the book of James chapter 4 and the third verse ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust and it's not every kind of knocking that is going to have the door opened in the parable of the ten the the ten virgins the five wise and the five foolish in matthew chapter 25 and verse 11 After the door was shut, it says, Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, open to us. It was knock, knock. But Jesus didn't say, Who there? He said, You go away. And in the 20th chapter of Matthew, we see the sons of Zebedee. They lift up their request unto Christ. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 22 But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, We are able. They didn't even know what they were praying for. You know, they were praying so far out of the will of God that they did not even know what they were talking about. There are those in the Word of Faith movement And I'm talking about the Copenhagens. Kenny Copeland and Kenny Hagen and all that little bunch. And they will actually tell you that if you pray according to the will of God, it's a lack of faith. That, you know, they're they're truly the bad side of the sons of Zebedee that you can just ask any kind of carnal nonsense you want. Uh, That's what the book of James talks about, asking amiss. And... In First John, the fifth chapter, and the fourteenth verse, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. That's a confidence for us this evening, that whatever we ask according to His will, there is one at the right hand of the Father that will hear us this evening. In, in the Gospel of Mark, in the 11th chapter, I want to read a couple verses here. And um, I'll read this out of my... Um, this is my Cambridge Bible my uh, with the New Testament and the Apocrypha. And I love this Bible for a lot of reasons, but for one reason, it has the King James translator's notes uh, in the margin. And that basically means uh, we translated it this way, but the language of the original, it could also very well bear this interpretation. So it's very insightful as it, in many places as it is in this text. In Mark 11 and 22, and Jesus answering saith unto them have faith in God and the margin note said or have the faith of God and Jesus you know we think well how can God have faith well Jesus was God and he had faith as a man he was fully God fully man and by faith he served his father The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and anointed him. He did what he did under the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, if G and like, for instance, if Jesus was going to do a miracle, and I use the old hokey Clark Kent and Superman illustration, you know, Clark Kent could go into the phone booth and come out as Superman. You know, Jesus didn't go into the phone booth and come out as Superman when he was going to do a miracle. He did it as a man by faith and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's why you and I can learn from him and have that as our pattern and example in our service 
unto the Lord. Jesus believed every word his father said. He says, I don't do anything that I do not hear and see my father do. That's the faith of God Jesus had, and we are to be that locked in upon Jesus that we have the faith of God. Now, let's go down to verse 24 in Mark 11. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Now, boy, that is a big one, isn't it? And we can do that in faith believing when we can meet the conditions and uh, we can pray that prayer of faith. And in verse 25, here's another condition right here. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, I'm going to close with the 15th chapter of John and the 7th verse. And this really begin, brings into perspective what it means to have the faith of God in John chapter 15 and verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. Jesus had the faith of God because every word his father spoke, that is what he spoke. Everything he saw his father do, that's what he did. And if we will do the same, if we'll have the faith of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, be as serious about the words of Jesus as Jesus was about the Father's words. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Over and over I say that the doctrine of Christ is the most important thing in your life. And if we will just immerse ourselves in Jesus, and over and over I use that acronym, the cross, the doctrine, and the example of Christ, we can have the faith of God and we can ring those prayer bells of heaven and that's what we have to do we have to understand that this world system is going to come after us but that's all right because we can feast when the lions starve this is for anyone who wants to give their heart to the lord if they need to have a little guidance on how to pray Maybe you might want to say this prayer with me. Father God, I know I have not been living as you want me to. I am tired of living my life without your help. Break my stubborn will and help me to follow you. Please forgive me for my sins. I believe that your son Jesus died upon the cross to pay the price for my sins. Teach me your ways and fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can serve you for the rest of my life. I believe by my faith in what Jesus did on the cross, I am justified or made right with you. Help me to learn more about you as I read your Holy Bible. Please help me to follow your commandments and the doctrine of Jesus. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. I give myself totally to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have made that choice to follow Christ, then please contact us. We just really enjoy hearing your testimony. Now with that, I'm going to conclude our teaching for this evening, as always, with great thanks to each and every one of you that joined us for this broadcast this evening. And... um, Tomorrow night on the Midnight Ride, uh, I'll be there with John. Uh, the Midnight Ride will be uh, the Tartarian Keys, the yep, yep, the Tartarian King of a Fierce Countenance, and it'll be snappy. I guarantee. A Sunday night, we'll be here in the FOJC Radio Studio with uh, Tracy, the Priest of the Feathered, Feathered Serpents. It's going to be a hot weekend here at. Uh, the Puritan barn, I guarantee you, going to be a lot of word going up, a lot of prayers going up, and um, that's the way we like it. We like to keep it hot and spicy around here. So, 
with that, a big thank you. Remember, if you're not registered for Pentecost, get registered and come on out May 28th. And with that, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just can't thank you enough for your goodness and mercy and grace toward us. We just can't thank you enough for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ whose hearts have joined together as one to see your gospel go forward. Father, we just love you so much and we know that any good thing that comes from our humble efforts is all of you and none of us and we just want to give you the praise for everything good that happens. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we agree. Amen and amen. God bless you all. And we will see you next Friday night, 6 p.m. Central, on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. you for listening and joining in fellowship with us here at FOJC Radio Remnant Gathering. You can contact us at FOJC Post Office Box 671 Tell City, Indiana 47586 or you can email us at lastdayschurch at cs.com or you may call us at 812 812- 836-2288. You can check out our website at www.fojcradio.com. Thanks and God bless.